This video is going to be a full preview of just the running back position for week nine of fantasy football, all right? I'm going to go game by game, talking about every fantasy relevant running back, whether I'd sit him, whether I'd start him, whether I love him, whether I hate him, and everything in between. Brand new piece of content. I have not done this before. So let me know if y'all want to see me do this weekly. If you want to see it with other positions, we'll go through every single game. We'll talk about the game a little bit, and we'll throw some accompanying stats on the screen that are more team related that hopefully help y'all make a little bit better decisions with your sit starts for week nine. All right. I would say happy Halloween, but I couldn't find my costume. And by costume, I literally was just going to use one of those like orange traffic cones and BT Higgins for the week. Okay but couldn't find it. So we are not T Higgins, unfortunately. But fortunately, for those of y'all that have running backs playing in tonight's game, we have the New York Jets versus the Houston Texans on Thursday Night Football in New York. We've got New York as one and a half point favorites. This is a 42 point over under. Speaking of the running backs in tonight's game, if Brees Hall has just a single yard, just a single yard, you will win on underdog fantasy. Okay, they just want to get you onto the platform. So they're giving you a completely free square. If he gets half a yard tonight, you are a winner on underdog fantasy. In order to get this free square, sign up on the platform with our code BDGE. So go download the underdog app. It'll be the first link down below. Use BDGE, deposit $10. They'll hit you with a deposit bonus plus this free square up on the screen right now. Brees Hall. And Joe Mixon are the only two fantasy relevant running backs right now in this game. They're obviously high end running back ones that are in your lineup week in and week out. Braylon Allen is coming off of a, a decent game. I think he was like 12 for 32 and a touchdown last week. He did get a little bit more goal line action. I don't really expect I think that was just maybe game flow, whatever the case may be. Allen's not someone that you're going to want in your lineup. He is someone that you're going to want to hold on to for the remainder of the season. Obviously, as a very, very high end handcuff. This is the time of the season that those are where your bench spots really should be uh, utilized on those, you know, uh, Braylon Allen's and Blake Corum's and all those types of dudes, because those injuries are league switching type injuries that give you a high end RB1, high end RB2 that change the face of the playoff matchup. So for Braylon Allen, I'm not starting him in really any scenario tonight, but you're definitely going to want to stash him. So high end RB1s for Brees Hall for Joe Mixon. Moving on to the Sunday slate, we have Dallas and Atlanta. Now, Atlanta is at home. The three point favorites, 52 point over under. So they're obviously expecting this game to be extremely pass heavy. But as you can see on the screen, Dallas is the worst run defense in the NFL. They are currently ranked 32nd in just run defense, their grade for PFF, their EPA rank per rush. 32nd, dead last. Fantasy points per game allowed to the running back position. This is full PPR. 29th. So Bijan, obviously high end RB1. I will say for Tyler Algier, I don't love Tyler Algier in this game. Like he's not someone I'm really looking to get into my lineup. I think a lot of the hype with Algier comes from games where we expect to dominate the game script. And I say weeks. I'm unfortunately an Atlanta Falcons fan. He had the big game against Carolina a couple weeks ago. That makes sense to me because we are supposed to dominate Carolina and we won by, I think it was 18 points. So he gets a lot of work. In close games, it is Bijan in the backfield. Don't conflate good matchups with good game scripts. Tyler Algier is a guy who will have good games based on good game scripts, but not just because it's a good matchup. Bijan's going to explode probably. Um, I do think Dallas is getting a little healthier on defense. Deron Bland, I believe, returned to practice. Micah Parsons might be in this game. So they're a little bit healthier. Still, Bijan, obviously in your lineup. Uh, Tyler Algier, very hesitant to get him into my lineup, to be honest with you. Dallas side of things, we had Zeke lead the backfield last week because Rico Dowdle was just randomly ruled out with an illness, whatever. So I expect him to be full go, ready to play. As you can see, Atlanta is a relatively good run defense, middle of the pack, but probably more closely uh, above average. Even though like Rico Dowdle became the guy, it kind of like he had the, the one real big week a few weeks ago, and then we just assumed he was like the RB1. Even in most of those games, even in the big games, his snap percentage has not gotten above 51%. Like I, I think he's very startable. I don't think Zeke is startable. I don't think Dalvin Cook is startable if Rico Dowdle is playing. Rico, I think you can get into your lineup because he'll get the touches, but I think he's way more of like a low-end RB2 flex play that's kind of touchdown dependent at this point because he's not like explosive he doesn't make big plays happen he's not someone that I expect to just like make a lot of stuff happen on his own so I'm not overly excited about Rico Dowdle although I think you can play him. next we move into an AFC East matchup we got Miami traveling to Buffalo Buffalo six point favorites 49 point over under now when I look at these two teams they're both relatively good run defenses if you look at EPA 
per rush rank. Uh, they're both within the top 10. They have allowed a lot of points to fantasy running backs. A lot of it is receiving work. A lot of it is um, teams needing to play catch up and whatnot. So that kind of accounts for the green on the chart there. James Cook coming off a really big game. He is getting goal line work like he's a threat to go for over 100 yards from scrimmage and a touchdown any given week. So he's in a really good matchup relatively against Miami, who, again, like in the, in the offseason, lost some big pieces that matter to this offensive line. They lost uh christian wilkins they lost like a lot of the interior power that they had so i look at james cook he's an rb1 in your lineup on the flip side of things you have devon achan who went for 150 and a touchdown last week super involved in the receiving game which is where i think he'll make a lot of his money in this one since achan has returned from his concussion he has played 57 and 58 percent of the snaps where he mostly was obviously very involved last week he took all of the carries inside the five yard line he's actually taken all the carries inside the five yard line in each of the last two weeks which can be a little bit problematic. Uh, he's playing around 40% of the snaps right now. It is definitely A-Chan's backfield there. It is definitely A-Chan being used as like the weapon two there. So it feels like it's Tyreek, then A-Chan in the passing game, which makes me super confident in him, obviously, in any sort of PPR league. I do think there's a, a world where like, this week, you know, A-Chan just happens to get the goal line work and, and things break right. And he could have had three touchdowns last week and 150 yards from scrimmage. But they want to use Mostert, obviously. Mostert's like their intimidating downhill uh, type of back. And I don't think they're ever going to really take him out of the lineup as long as he is healthy. So A-Chan, high-end RB1. Mostert, I think, is playable, but he's definitely got a really low floor. Like, if he doesn't get into the end zone, he's probably going to flop for you. So, again, more of a flex play, not overly excited despite the couple touchdowns last week. I think at any given moment, we we could see the goal line work just kind of flip there. You're obviously not starting Jalen Wright. Uh, James Cook's great. Ray Davis really won't be relevant unless they get into uh, a really good game script, but I, I don't think it's going to be one where it gets so far away that Buffalo is just, you know, given their running backs 40 touches. Moving on, we got Las Vegas traveling to Cincinnati. Cincinnati is seven-point favorite, so that is pretty heavily in favor of the, the running backs here for the Bengals, 46.5 point over under. Cincinnati has a terrible EPA per rush rank, but much better in run D rank per PFF. So probably closed the gap a little bit there. I think a lot of where Cincinnati struggled was in the beginning of the season when they were down without uh, a lot of their interior defensive linemen, Sheldon Rankins and a couple other starters there, which uh, led to huge games for running back. So I don't think it's as easy as uh, most people had been looking at it earlier on. Alexander Madison is beginning a shitload of touches. More often than not, it turns into not you know it it ends up being like a double digit carries for 20 yards some shit like that but he's also shown productive games where he'll get 15 20 touches and turn it into you know 70 80 yards we'll get the goal line opportunity so i think madison's certainly still playable because cincinnati's probably like a bottom half of the league run defense overall still so i wouldn't be dying to get him out of my lineup i think he'll catch a ton of passes like he has been getting a lot of pass catching work as well as the carries here they just can get nothing effective going on the ground but madison is still definitely playable in my eyes as a flex play on the flip side chase brown has now scored i think at five consecutive games he's been in double digit fantasy points in five consecutive games he's taken over as a lead back there that being said though zach moss really isn't going anywhere because they they trust him in passing situations like on long down and distance snaps he's still playing around 80 percent of them in two and four minute drills uh zach moss has played 100 percent of those snaps pretty much week in and week out he's still getting carries but he's legitimately like the least effective carrier in the nfl right now there are are opportunities for him to get in from the goal line as well like they give him sparing goal line opportunities where he just can't convert them and he does catch a decent amount of passes so like zach moss i think if you're in a pinch if you have if you're one of those people that suffered a shitload of injuries at the wide receiver position and you're looking for a flex like the matchup's really good against las vegas and zach moss does get pass catching work he does get sporadic goal line work so he could end up catching three four passes and get into the end zone and give you like 14 15 points Obviously, you'd rather go elsewhere, but I don't think he's like the worst flex start this week. I think Chase Brown's a really, really strong flex or RB2 uh, start for you. If you've had him on your team, obviously, you know that and you've been starting week in and week out. Most likely we got the Chargers and we've got Cleveland. Now, this is one that I'm, I'm having a tough time really getting a good read on. The Chargers are one and a half point favorites. They're on on the road at Cleveland, uh, 43 and a half point over under. Now, the Chargers have been much more pass heavy over the last few weeks. They're kind of letting Herbert sling it and they do get back uh, Quentin Johnson. They do get back DJ Chark. Lad McConkey's obviously looked really good. They will get back Hayden Hurst. So they have a lot of their pass catching options back. And then Cleveland obviously has Jameis Winston, who threw the ball a thousand times last week. That was against a Baltimore beat up secondary. So I think at the end of the day, both these teams do want to be run heavy. Nick Chubb has gotten a lot of work, but like I still don't know that we see 
full scale Nick Chubb uh, in terms of efficiency, in terms of production, really until like November, realistically, even if that. And we look at the matchups like you see a lot of red, a lot of orange on these charts like they're run D ranked per PFF. Cleveland is number one EPA per rush rank. L.A. is number six fantasy points per game allowed to the running back position. Both of them are top five. So top five in terms of like hardest schedules for opposing running backs. Dobbins has been getting a lot of volume, but not a ton of efficiency. Same thing with Nick Chubb. So like maybe they could score a, a touchdown, get some pass catching work here, more likely towards Dobbins. But I think I look at both of them. Dobbins, I would much rather start than Chubb. And Dobbins, I still look at like a relatively solid, you know, low end RB2. Like I'm, I'm not scared off of the matchup. I'm not scared about putting him into my lineup because he's getting so much work. Chubb scares me a little bit. Like this Chargers defense is very good. This could be a very slow paced game where if the Chargers do get ahead and they're not in a game script where Nick Chubb can really carry the ball a ton of times, that gets me a little bit nervous. So I think a lot of people are probably in a position where they have to start Nick Chubb. But if you have better flex options, I would I would lean that way. Moving down, we got New England and we have Tennessee. We've got Tennessee at home, three and a half point favorites, 38 point over under. This is going to be kind of gross. We're still waiting on word about Drake May. Obviously, if Drake May is in the lineup, we like this game a lot more. I'm sure the over under the total will move up uh, pretty significantly. He is in the concussion protocol, uh, so we might get Jacoby Brissett. Regardless, this is a, a damn good matchup for Tennessee. The New England run defense has been uh, atrocious. Tennessee's run defense has been kind of on and off. They started the year off really, really hot. They've been a little worse as the weeks have progressed, and I think they've just lost so much steam and uh, momentum and just like motivation on both sides of the ball because of how poorly they're playing at this point. I think one thing to note, Tony Pollard obviously is in your lineup week in and week out. Tajay Spears is looking to be active for the first time in quite a while with the hamstring strain. He's kind of battled that all season. Tajay's not a dude you're getting into your lineup until until you see something. I think he's a stash worth having because he's shown last year that he's a very talented back. He, he's another dude that like if Tony Pollard were to get hurt, Tajay probably steps into a massive high upside role because he's a really good pass catcher. But right now you just kind of hold on to him. With Ramondre Stevenson, you have to start him, I think. Like two touchdowns last week. If he doesn't get those touchdowns, we're looking at a really shitty game. But that is, you know, what his role is. He is the goal line back there. This offense, I think, overall has probably outperformed what we'd expect them to do, even under Jacoby Brissett, which the bar is really fucking low there to begin with. You start Ramondre as an RB2, but like you're not fired up about it. You probably need a, a touchdown scorer for him. So that's a game where like if I lived in Tennessee, it'd be you'd be hard pressed to to get me to go to that stadium out there in Nashville uh, unless the tickets were extremely cheap. Lucky for y'all, lucky for y'all, we do have a code with SeatGeek. If y'all have not used SeatGeek yet, it is the best provider of tickets out there. You know, NBA just started. The World Series obviously just ended. So no more baseball games for y'all. But if you're in the Nashville area and you want to cop tickets and get 10% off your purchase, which those tickets I can't imagine are more than like $14 to begin with, use code BDGE10 when you check out. All right. So no matter what sporting event you're going to, no matter what team you are a fan of, we'll hook you up with BDG10 on SeatGeek. All right. SeatGeek.com. Promo code BDG10, the link down below. Go check out some tickets for next week's game. If your team's fighting for a playoff spot, go have a damn experience, all right? Go experience a fun game one time in your life, and it's because of us. It's because we're hooking you up with that discounted price. SeatGeek, BDGE10, a beautiful marriage. Let's get it. Next up, we've got Washington at New York. Now, this is a game I could actually see myself going to. I want to see Jaden Daniels play as a rookie. If I were going, I would go to SeatGeek and use promo code BDG 10, get 10% off to go see the rookie of the year, play some QB minus three and a half point favorites, 44 over under, as you could see a pretty good matchup on both sides of the ball. Now injury designations are going to play a large part in this one because Tyrone Tracy left with a concussion in week eight. Usually that leaves running backs 50, 50, uh, slightly towards them not playing. I will say if, if Tyrone Tracy is playing and he's passed the concussion protocol, he is a must-start player this week. He is uh, He's looked as good as any running back in the NFL, probably not named Derrick Henry at this point. Uh, Tyrone Tracy is explosive. He is he's awesome. I, I Huge fan of Tyrone Tracy coming out of school. Huge fan of what he's doing so far this year. So I think if Tyrone Tracy is clear to the concussion protocol, he's a must-start, like top 20 running back, if not top 15 at this point. On the flip side, now if Tracy misses, I'm – I'm definitely getting Singletary into, into my lineup as my RB2 or flex. I think he's a really, really strong uh, start there. Because if you remember Singletary early on before he got hurt and lost his job to Tracy, Singletary was a 20-touch-per-game guy. And 
giving you way better fantasy days than you know I, I think we thought he would give us early on the season. So Tracy must start if he plays. If Tracy misses this game with a concussion, I think Singletary definitely belongs into your lineup. Washington, don't overthink Brian Robinson. I know he's looked a little bit worse over the last couple of weeks uh, as opposed to earlier on in the year. I think he'll continue to get more healthy, and this is just a smash uh, matchup for them. So Brian Robinson needs to be in your lineup, top 15 guy. Austin Eckler's been getting a good amount of run, man. 58% of the snaps last week. He's still running like above 50% of the routes. His target share on the season is around 11%, and Jeremy McNichols is completely taking a back seat now that Eckler and Brian Robinson are both healthy. So I think you could start both of them. I think Eckler's definitely more of a flex play. Obviously needs to be kind of like in that PPR mold. He has just a single carry inside the five-yard line on the season, so I don't expect him to just get any lucky touchdowns at this point. So you are banking on most of those points coming through the air. But I do think Eckler is a top, you know, Top 25-ish option there and uh, can definitely be put into your flex and you feel okay about it. Now, we move to the New Orleans Saints on the road at Carolina. The Saints are 7.5-point favorites, 43.5-point total here. We have Bryce Young as the starter again for Carolina. Deontay Johnson no longer there. The Carolina defense, I mean, I, I just I don't think we've seen something like this this bad uh, in, in as long as I can remember doing this fucking job. Okay. So you're starting obviously Alvin Kamara. He's probably like the RB one in most people's rankings this week. I can't imagine a world where he is not Kendra Miller suffered a hamstring strain. So he's probably out. Uh, you're obviously not starting Jamal Williams on the flip side. We have Chuba going against the Saints, and the Saints' run defense is also terrible. So I think you start Chuba with confidence. Uh, Jonathan Brooks may be activated this week and playing on a limited basis. You're definitely not putting Brooks into your lineup until we see what he does, what that split looks like. I think even if he's playing this week and he gets snaps, like I just don't see a world where they where they take away a huge portion of the work from Chuba, at least not for like a month at this point, right? There's just no reason for it. Caroline is a dumpster fire of a team and you don't want to push this kid early on and like risk him missing extra time next year, practice time during the off season. Like all this rehab time is really, really important. And they've taken their time with him. Like it's been, it's been, I think 11 months since the ACL, ACL tear. So someone who's, you know, 21 years old, 20 years old, whatever, he's really, really young and takes that long. He's probably nearing the end of where he needs like full health uh, to kind of He's taking the time to be at full health. So, like, I think they're going the right direction. I just don't ever see a world where they need to push him because of how Chuba's playing. If Chuba was playing poorly, if he was playing like some of these other backs in the NFL at this point, like, I could see them being like, all right, let's give Brooks the, the workload and let him, like, fucking run it for us. But Chuba's been extremely competitive. So, Brooks, you're not putting into your lineup even if he's active. Chuba, you're putting into your lineup regardless of Brooks' status. Moving on to Denver and Baltimore. All right, so we've got Baltimore and Derrick Henry, which is an auto start. On the Denver side of things, this is a nine-point spread. So Denver is nine-point underdogs on the road in Baltimore, 45-and-a-half point over under. So I kind of expect there to be a decent amount of pass-catching work for these running backs, and this is already a team that obviously throws to the running backs at a very high clip. These are two very, very good defenses, especially good run defenses, I more particularly because Baltimore's pass defense is kind of atrocious as well. When you look at the numbers here, However, Baltimore did just lose Michael Pierce, which is one of their premier defensive tackles at this point, which will open up things for the run game a little bit. I actually, despite Javante struggling against Carolina, I don't hate the idea of throwing him back into your lineup. I know the game script favors Jaleel McLaughlin. I just don't think you're going to get anything efficient out of him, and he doesn't score a lot of touchdowns. Like He scored last week, so it almost feels like he's not due for another fucking four weeks to score a touchdown. I think Javante will catch like three to five passes. I think he'll get a decent amount of work. I don't think you'll see that bad of an efficiency game out of the Denver backfield because of some of the injuries to Baltimore. So Javante, borderline top 25 guy for me. I, I don't think he is absolutely a must sit this week is, is basically what I'm getting at here. Jacksonville and Philadelphia. We have Jacksonville in Philly, seven and a half point underdogs, 45 and a half point total here. Jacksonville's defense overall has been bad. Their pass defense especially is really, really bad. So I expect this to be a very pass-heavy game for uh, Jalen Hurts and the Philadelphia offense. Obviously, Saquon is a must-start every single week. On the flip side, Tank's been really, 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 really good, but the game script has to go in his favor because he is not a dude who catches the ball. And at seven and a half point favorites, Philadelphia is, that's not a good game script for Tank. So it really comes down to like how quickly does Philly get away from Jacksonville in this game. Do they get away from Jacksonville in this game? Probably. Uh, Philly's a much better run defense than Jacksonville is, though they're still kind of like middle of the pack overall. 
Uh, I think they're a little bit overrated as a run defense. I think Tank is playable. I think Travis Etienne is likely back in this game, which obviously dampers the outlook a little bit. And we don't know exactly what the workload is going to look like. I think at this point, it's Bigsby's backfield. I think Etienne will probably be limited. When you miss multiple weeks, usually that first game back, you are uh, you know, you're you're getting a portion of the opportunity that you got when you came back uh, from that injury. All right, so Tank, I think is a, I, I think Tank is very startable. I think you could put him into your RB two slot. I think you could put him in your flex spot. Etn, I'm completely staying away from until we see startable games out of him. So we're off that one. All right, when we move down this next game, we've got Arizona, one and a half point favorites at home against Chicago, forty four and a half point total here. I don't think there's anything tricky about the running backs in this game if you have James Conner you're obviously starting him if you have DeAndre Swift you are obviously starting him as well keep moving down we got Detroit we got Green Bay Detroit is three and a half point favorites on the road at Green Bay 48 and a half point total I think that's risking that's factoring in the risk that Malik Willis might be starting we don't know Jordan Love says he's optimistic although he's not practicing right now again this is not a matchup where I think anything is tricky here if you have Josh Jacobs you're obviously starting him it is a tough matchup because Detroit's run defense is really good but like you're not going to sit Josh Jacobs on the flip side you're obviously starting both Demont and Jameer Gibbs moving down we've got the Rams and we've got Seattle this is another one where I don't think things are very tricky here the, the remaining games I don't feel like it's worth wasting time on, on backfields where we know the situation very, very clearly. We've got the Rams on the road in Seattle. The Rams are one-and-a-half-point favorites, 48-point total. You're obviously starting Kyron Williams. If you own Kyron Williams, you want to own Blake Corum. That is so important down the final stretch here. Seattle, on the flip side, you are obviously starting Kenneth Walker. You're not starting Zach Charbonnet, okay? We can move along to Sunday Night Football. We've got Indianapolis traveling to Minnesota. Minnesota, five-point favorites, 46-and-a-half-point total total here. Minnesota up to this point has been one of, if not the best run defenses in the NFL, but Jonathan Taylor looked amazing. Uh, we got Joe Flacco under center and the point total of this game went up by like two points, I believe, since that announcement happened. So we do expect the Colts offense to be a lot more efficient. You're not started, You're not sitting Jonathan Taylor. You're obviously not sitting Aaron Jones either. So you're playing both of those backs. Sunday night football parlays into Monday night football. We have Tampa Bay, on the road in Kansas City at Arrowhead, eight and a half point underdogs, 46 point total here. Now, KC is not tricky. You're obviously starting Kareem Hunt. On the flip side, though, when we look at Tampa Bay, things do get a little spicy here. Let's break down some of the snap percentages. Last week in the first game without Evans and the first game without Chris Godwin, both of them without uh, we saw the running backs really, really heavily involved. And we've seen a pretty similar snap share between Rashad White and Bucky Irving all year. It's been around like 60 to 40, 55 to 45, usually in favor of Rashad White. I think both of them are extremely playable. Rashad White's obviously super, super used, super productive in the passing game. They are eight and a half point underdogs. So you'd imagine that they're going to have to throw the ball a ton here. Bucky Irving has been incredible on the ground, so he'll get some ground game. He's gotten a ton of the goal line carries as well, 57% of them on the season. So he's probably the guy that's more likely to score while Rashad White is going to catch more passes. Last week, Rashad White played 56% of the snaps. Bucky Irving played 42% of them. Rashad White ran more routes, but Bucky got more carries. Bucky was pretty heavily targeted, though, and I think that might be a theme where it's like Bucky is more of an early down player, but because they are with a lack of receiving options, those targets on first and second down might start to gear more towards the running backs than the lack of options at wide receivers. So we could see Bucky, who had a 44% target per out run rate last week, 15% of the team's targets, which was actually higher than Rashad White. Um I think Bucky and Rashad White are both extremely startable. It's obviously a very tough matchup. Like the Kansas City run defense is one of the best in the NFL, as you can see by the numbers. Their PFF run D rank is fourth. Their EPA per rush rank is third. And their fantasy points per game allowed to the running back position is number one in the NFL for PPR. So not a great matchup, but I still think you're rolling out both Rashad White and Bucky Irving. Sean Tucker is down to like 10% of the snaps there. So he's a little bit annoying. He's getting a few touches, but he's obviously not in your lineup. And I don't think he's playing enough to affect the way that I'm thinking about Rashad White or Bucky Irving for week nine. All right. Well, that rolled on way longer than I thought. I actually thought this might be a 12 minute video. Uh, that was just a fucking lie. All right. So here's the thing. I guess for Halloween, I showed up as a liar. What else is new? It's what I show up as every day anyway. So 
that's going to be it for this video. Again, if you're not on underdog yet, you can go get the free square for tonight's game. Thursday night football, you got like seven more hours left to go cop it. You'll see the free square by depositing with our code BDGE when you deposit $10 or more for the first time. And of course, SeatGeek, go get your tickets for the game. Christmas in two months, there's still football games going on. All right. So when you go buy your dad tickets, when you go buy your brother tickets, when you go buy a family member tickets, whoever it is, use promo code BDG10. You'll get 10% off your tickets on SeatGeek.com. That's it. If you missed the wide receiver rankings for this week, we will link them here and you can go watch that video now.